So first of all, thank you all so much for joining us today. My name is Johanna Newman, and I am the Senior Director of Environment America's Campaign for 100% Renewable Energy. I am really excited to emcee today's conversation about how states are uniting all across America for a vision of a future powered 100% by clean renewable energy. We have some really terrific presenters joining us for today's panel. So first, Stanford Professor Mark Jacobson and Tony Dutzik, the Associate Director of Frontier Group, will focus on the big picture opportunities and large clean energy trends in America. Next, we will hear from leaders in states that have committed to 100% clean or renewable energy, including California State Senator John Laird, who was the lead sponsor of the recently enacted bill to add interim goals to reach California's commitment to repower itself with 100% clean energy by 2045. And we'll also hear from Governor Daniel McKee, the governor of Rhode Island, who earlier this summer signed into law the nation's fastest transition to 100% renewable energy of any state. Next, we'll also hear from Adam Schultz from the Oregon Department of Energy. And then we'll hear from Ben Hellerstein, the State Director of Environment Massachusetts Research and Policy Center. And after our panelists wrap up, we'll offer some resources for how you can take part in America's transition to 100% renewable energy, and we'll have some time for questions and discussion. So again, um, if you're just now joining us, please put your name and where you're Zooming in from into the chat. And as questions arise, please use the Q&A function of the webinar to ask your questions. So that's our plan. And before I get to our speakers, I was just hoping to make a few opening comments myself. So I have two children. And when I think about the future that we're leaving for our children and our children's children, it's important to me that we strive to build a world where the way that we produce and consume energy has a vanishingly small impact on our natural world. Our energy system, like those in nature, should be efficient, elegant, and restorative. Now, we are still a long ways away from reaching that vision, as you can see on the next slide. America still gets much too much of its energy from dirty energy sources that harm our environment and our health but we are making very real and tangible progress as you'll see in today's webinar. Next slide. And as of this summer, thanks to Rhode Island's action, 10 states across America have now committed to 100% clean or 100% renewable energy with clear commitments to grow renewables this decade. And on this map, the deep gold states are the states that have made those 100% commitments. And the light gold states are states where Environment America and our state groups, as well as other organizations, are actively campaigning for 100% renewable or 100% clean commitments. All this work is adding up. Next slide, please. Fully one in three Americans now lives in a community that has committed to 100% clean energy. And the list of communities making this commitment just keeps growing. Add this to the fact that this summer, Congress extended clean energy tax credits that have the potential to turbocharge clean energy deployment across America, and the future of clean energy truly is bright. So without further ado, I would love to introduce Dr. Mark Jacobson. Um, Dr. Jacobson is going to share the latest research on the potential for clean and renewable energy sources to meet our needs. And for those who don't know him, 
Dr. Jacobson is the director of the Atmosphere and Energy Program at Stanford University, where he's been on the faculty since 1994. Throughout his career, Mark has focused on better understanding air pollution and global warming problems and developing large scale, clean, renewable energy solutions to those problems. He has published six textbooks and over 175 peer reviewed journals and is recognized globally as one of the leaders of the movement for 100% renewable energy. Mark, thank you so much for joining us today. We're thrilled to have you. Yeah, thank you, Johanna, for inviting me and for all Environment America has been doing uh, to further the 100% movement uh, in the United States and even outside. Um, so I'm going to talk about plans that we've been developing for transitioning states and countries in the world to 100% clean renewable energy. And actually, can I share my slides on here? It looks like it's disabled. If not, I can I can just talk about it. Um, we can set up that functionality. Give us just a second. Rachel, can you tee that up for Dr. Jacobson, please? But um, basically, basically, you know, the idea behind these plans has always been, I mean, we developed our first plan in 2009. It was really a worldwide plan to transition, see if it was possible technically and economically to transition the entire world to 100% clean renewable energy. And the conclusion then was, well, yes, it's technically and economically possible, but for social and political reasons, it may not actually happen until uh, you know, maybe 2050, but with at least 30, with at least 80% by 2030. And we still think that you know, we, we need 80% transition by 2030 for all energy sectors, that's electricity, transportation, buildings, and industry. But, uh, and even in some, in some sectors, we could even get to 100% in some states. Uh, but we should at least push for as fast, faster than 2050 is the end goal. I think 2035 is a better end goal today than 2050. Although, um, you know, if we can get 80% by 2030 and even 90% by 2035, that would be amazing. But I, we should be pushing as fast as possible for a transition in all energy sectors. Um, looks like I can share my screen now, so I'll do that here. Um, Okay, so I think I'm going to just split this. So, okay, so all energy sectors, well, we're, I'm going to focus on electricity, transportation, heating and cooling for buildings mostly and in industry. And so the idea behind our energy plans has always been to electrify all sectors, and that includes some electrolytic hydrogen which I'll discuss, and then provide that electricity with wind and water and solar power. So for transportation, we'd use primarily battery electric vehicles and hydrogen fuel cell vehicles, where the hydrogen fuel cell electric vehicles are mostly for long distance transport, like long distance aircraft, long distance ships, and long distance trains and trucks. And But everything else would be battery electric in terms of transportation for heating and cooling for buildings, we'd use electric heat pumps for air conditioning, uh, air heating and water heating, there will be some district heating and cooling where even that district heat would come from uh, either heat pumps or direct geothermal heat or solar heat. But we would not use, for example, no hydrogen in buildings. We do not want to you know, switch hydrogen from you know, natural gas pipes to hydrogen pipes or mixture because, first of all, heat pumps are much more efficient than combustion. And it's, it's basically a waste of hydrogen to use them in buildings for heating. Hydrogen should only be used for long distance transport for steel production and ammonia production, uh, and maybe remote microgrids for combined electricity and heat, but not for building heating, not for stationary electricity storage, and not for passenger vehicles. Uh, for industry, we'd electrify that too with uh, high temperature uh, electrical processes, such as electric arc furnaces, furnaces, uh, induction furnaces, resistance furnaces, dielectric heaters, electron beam heaters. We provide all the electricity for all these sectors with just onshore and offshore wind, solar photovoltaics on rooftops and in power plants, concentrated solar power, geothermal uh, electricity, hydroelectricity, tidal wave electricity. But we do need storage, uh, but that includes electricity storage, hot and cold storage, and hydrogen storage. So the electricity storage options we already have available are concentrated solar power, pumped hydro, existing hydroelectric dams, batteries, flywheels, compressed air storage and gravitational storage. Of course, batteries 
are ideal because they don't take up much, much space and you can put them pretty much anywhere. So if their costs, which are about 100 to $150 a kilowatt hour, drop to about $60 a kilowatt hour, then we can pretty much solve all instability, grid instability problems with batteries. We're already starting that. In California, there's already three gigawatts of batteries installed, and those are already helping to avoid blackouts on the grid. But there's already low cost hot and cold storage, water tank storage, ice storage, underground storage and boreholes, water pits, aquifers, and also building materials is another form of, of heat storage. And then hydrogen is a form of storage. Um, I'm, I'm going to point out this district heating system. District heating is, you know, right now 7% of the US is under district heating, where you have centralized heaters, and in this case, coolers as well. And then you have a piping system to pipe hot and cold water to buildings to provide air and water heating and cooling. Uh, Stanford actually, we until 2016, there was a natural gas cogeneration plant providing 80% of the electricity and heat for the campus. That was uh, bulldozed and replaced with this fourth generation district heating and cooling system where you have two coolers, two chillers and a boiler. You have electric heat pumps to raise the temperature of the heat and lower the temperature of the cold. And there are about 35 uh, miles of of hot water pipes and another and 40 miles of cold water pipes around the university. And the electricity for this heating and cooling and also for the campus is coming from 150 megawatts of solar PV, which including 10 megawatts on campus and 140 megawatts off campus. And so the university is now 100% renewable, not only for electricity, but also heating and cooling. And it's the first university to do this. And that's um, a good step. I just want to say something really quickly about transitioning buildings because, you know, most people are cons that's a, a lot of energy is used in buildings and in vehicles. And um, I was lucky to be able to build a, a electric, an all electric home in 2017, has rooftop PV, has batteries in the garage, has electric cars, uh, heat pumps for air heating and air conditioning, and air and uh, water heating as well. Uh, these are the ductless mini split heat pumps for air heat and air conditioning. They use one fourth the energy as natural gas heaters. Uh, here's an electric heat pump that uh, it also uses one fourth the energy as a natural gas uh, heat pump water heater, and it just provides the same heat. And and then for a stove, instead of uh, gas, they use an electric induction cooktop. It works really well. I point out the the individual cooktop on the left that only costs between three, thirty and eighty dollars. And so worldwide, there are 7 million people die from air pollution, uh, mostly from energy. And a lot of those, about 40% are indoor from indoor burning of biofuels and coal for home heating and cooking. And these induction cooktops can replace burning in, inside homes uh, in these developing countries in particular at a very low cost. Of course, you need an electricity source and this is where microgrids will become important. But I just wanna point out that over five, during five years of energy use in the home, including for electric vehicles, I actually generated 120% of all my home and vehicle uh, use, energy use. I've had no electric bill, no natural gas bill or gasoline bill in five years. And I got paid an extra $860 a year on average from the Community Choice Aggregation Utility, which was Silicon Valley Clean Energy, who took over the generation portion of the bill. Um, PG&E still had the transmission distribution portion. But not only do you avoid yearly costs, but you avoid a gas hookup fee up front, which would have been $6,000, gas pipes, which, have been, which would have been about $10,000. This shows typical ranges here. But the, the payback time for the whole system for the solar and the batteries was five years with subsidies, and it would be 10 years without subsidy. But there's a 25-year warranty on the solar. And I'm only using half the batteries, and so those will last, and they're still working perfectly fine. Um, so those will last at least 20 years uh, as well. My point is, is that we should not have any new gas, any gas in any new homes, and we should try to get rid of gas out of all existing homes. This is a key to going to 100% renewables: is to eliminate natural gas use in homes. There's no need for two sources of energy in a building. But real question is: Can we transition the entire world and the United States and all individual states to 100% clean renewable energy and storage? So we've recently developed roadmaps for 145 countries. And the, interest, the important point I wanna make, one of the important points is that by electrifying all energy in a state or a country, you reduce power demand significantly. And just here's an example. This is a sum over 145 countries where the end use demand in, in 2018 was 13 trillion watts. 
and that would go up to 20.4 trillion watts in 2050. But when you electrify and provide the electricity with just wind and water and solar, your demand goes down about 56% to about nine terawatts. And that's due to the efficiency of electric vehicles and hydrogen fuel cell vehicles over internal combustion engine vehicles, the efficiency of electrified industry, the efficiency of electric heat pumps for air heating and water heating in particular. You're eliminating all the energy needed to mine fossil fuels and uranium. And these plans that we're talking about, they have no nuclear, they have no biomass, bioenergy, biogas. They have no uh, carbon capture. They have no direct air capture. It's all providing all energy with wind and water and solar, but simultaneously eliminating non-energy uh, emissions as well. And then the final efficiency improvements due to end use energy efficiency beyond business as usual. So here's a timeline. This would apply to any state or country. Well, there's one timeline that ends in 2050. If we don't do anything, we'll go along the top line. But if we electrify and provide the electricity with wind, water, and solar, we go down those five shades of colors to the 100% WWS line. And then we provide that, that remaining demand for energy with just wind, water, and solar. And this shows 80% conversion by 2030 and 100% by 2050. But as I mentioned earlier, we really want if we can get 100% by 2035, that would be more ideal. Um, people say, well, this is gonna take a lot of land, but worldwide, the land use requirement is um, only 0.53%. We don't need any new land for offshore wind, tidal wave power, uh, rooftop PV. We're not adding any new hydro in these plans. We have a tiny amount of geothermal added. So really it's utility PV plus CSP, which which uh, takes up the what we call footprint on the ground, and that's 0.17% worldwide and 0.29% in the US. Uh, and then the spacing between wind turbines is about 0.36% uh, worldwide and 0.55% in the US. So total US is about 0.84%. Uh, for comparison, the, the fossil fuel industry occupies about 1.3% of US land area right now. So we think we'd use less land uh, than the fossil fuel industry. WECC, it should be just one C, is the Western Interconnect, and even that's even less land than the US as a whole. Um, so then, well, can the grid stay stable? Yes, we've, we've looked at the whole US, each state and groups of states and grid regions, and this is, for example, is the, the Western Interconnect, keeping the grid stable uh, every 30 seconds for two years, and I'm not going to go into the details, but I'm just saying that with this is accounting for the intermittency of wind and solar, and uh, in tidal and wave power, and also accounting for the variation of demand over time, just by, there's really four things you need to keep the grid stable. You need generators and you need some over generation. Uh, you'll need interconnections to ge connect geographically dispersed wind and solar and, and storage on the grid. You'll need storage itself and demand response. So those are the kind of the four main components of keeping the grid stable is, is grid interconnection, jet over generation, storage, and using demand response. And we find that we can keep the grid stable everywhere worldwide. What's the cost of that energy? Well, $62 trillion is the worldwide Green New Deal cost of going to 100% wind, water, solar everywhere. And I say worldwide, we looked at 145 countries and they represent 99.7% of all world emissions. Well, that $62 trillion, it'll turn out that pays itself off through energy sales within about five and a half to six years. And I'll show you why in a second. And this, in the US, it's about $9 trillion. And I'll talk about just briefly, what's the annual cost uh, in the Western interconnect, it's about $1 trillion up front. And we should, but, Dr. Jacobson, if you could find find a closing spot just so we can move on to some of our other speakers, that would be amazing. Yeah, okay, I'll just say this will be my last slide just to point this out. This is a really key thing that worldwide business as usual, it's about $18 trillion per year uh, is the energy cost uh, in 2050. Right now it's about $12 trillion per year, but the health cost is $34 trillion per year. The climate cost is about $32 trillion per year in 2050. It's a total $83 trillion per year social cost. If we electrify everything, go to wind, water, solar, we go down to $6.6 .6 trillion per year. So the energy cost goes down 63%, the social cost goes down 92%. That difference between 17.8 and $6.6 .6 trillion a year, that's a savings of around $11 trillion per year. That's how you get a payback time of the initial upfront cost 
of $62 trillion per year over five years. So the point is we save money. Well, it turns out we create jobs, we reduce land use, we eliminate 80,000 air pollution deaths in the US and 7 million worldwide by transitioning. We eliminate the emissions associated with global warming. So re there's really little downside to a transition and I'll leave it to uh, others to fill in the gaps here, but and we can answer questions later. Thanks very much. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Um, it is incredibly inspiring seeing the concrete examples, your own experiences at Stanford and in your home, as well as the global modeling that just shows how much of a no-brainer this transition is. Thank you so much. Sure. Um, all right, our next speaker um, is Tony Dutzik. Tony is the Associate Director and Senior Policy Analyst at Frontier Group. Um, Tony's research and ideas on climate and energy and transportation policy have helped shape public debates all across the United States. And Tony's um, work has been covered in the Washington Post to national public radio to outlets in between. Um, so Tony, take it away. And Flora, if you could tee up his slides, that would be great. Thanks, Johanna, and thanks everybody uh, for coming out to the webinar today. It's um, re I'm really pleased to be part of this esteemed panel of people uh, who are working to make uh, the dream of transitioning America to clean and renewable energy a reality one state at a time. Um, as Johanna mentioned, I work with Frontier Group. We are a research and public policy organization whose mission is to provide information and ideas to build a cleaner, healthier America. Uh, and since 2017, we have been tracking the rise of clean energy around the country uh, through a report that we call Renewables on the Rise. Uh, the next edition of that report is coming out on October 6th, uh, and I'm here today to share with you a couple of the top line findings of that report and also to give you a sneak preview of an exciting interactive dashboard that we're going to be sharing uh, next month uh, to enable you and folks you know to dive in a little bit deeper into the trends uh, on renewable energy and clean energy in your states. Next slide. So the good news is that clean energy continues to grow by leaps and bounds in the United States. We now generate more than three times as much electricity from the wind, the sun, and the earth as we did back in 2012. Um, energy efficiency efforts are continuing to play a critical role in meeting our energy challenges. And new technologies like electric vehicles and battery energy storage are beginning to move from the fringes of our energy system into the mainstream. Next slide. But while the growth of clean energy is a national story, it's also a mosaic of state stories, uh, as we have documented through the years. Uh, today, there are seven states that produce enough electricity from the wind, the sun, and the earth to cover at least half of their electricity consumption. And that's up from zero just five years ago. Uh, and the foundation for that growth in clean energy has really been laid uh, by the states uh, through the adoption of state policies like renewable electricity standards, clean car standards, and energy efficiency requirements. Um, and we find in this year's report that those efforts are continuing to make a critical difference. Um, Dr. Jacobson mentioned California. It's been a leader in many areas of clean energy for decades. Um, but in the last couple of years, uh, has made a strong commitment to expanding battery energy storage. Um, we find not only is California the number one state for battery storage installed in this year's report, uh, but we're already beginning to see the benefits of that investment um, through things like helping to ameliorate the energy grid crisis that occurred during the heat wave just a few weeks ago. Um, so again, leadership states continuing to raise the bar for clean energy progress. Next slide. But the other important trend that we're seeing in this year's report is that the renewable energy revolution is now becoming a 50-state affair. The states that have seen renewables grow the fastest in percentage terms over the last decade have not necessarily been the usual suspects, but they've been states like South Carolina, Virginia, and Georgia, states that a decade ago had virtually no wind and solar power, but are now beginning to develop a strong, stronger renewable energy economy. Um, you know, a few percentages of your electricity supply coming from renewables is not, you know, we have a long way to go from there to 100%, but it is beginning to show and we're beginning to see that every state has a role and a place to play in America's clean energy future. Next slide. We're also particularly excited this year to launch our new Renewables on the Rise dashboard. 
which will enable you to dive even deeper into the mosaic of stories about state progress on clean energy. You can see how your state's production of renewable energy has grown in the last decade, compare your state's progress with that of other states, dive deep into the data on wind and solar power, energy efficiency, electric vehicles, and battery storage, and review top line national findings on the growth of clean energy. You can also see some policy recommendations for how your state can continue to fuel the growth of clean energy in the years to come. And we hope that by celebrating the successes and the progress that we've made thus far in moving America toward a clean energy future, that we can draw inspiration, motivation, and lessons for the bigger challenges that lie ahead. Next slide. One more. Okay, so the new dashboard will be going live on October 6th, and you can find it at www.environmentamerica.org and www.frontiergroup.org. Uh, you can also follow us at Frontier Group at Frontier Group US on Twitter. Uh, and this is my contact information as well for anyone who wants to be in touch. So again, thank you for coming out and I look forward to the conversation later. Awesome, thank you so much, Tony. I'm incredibly excited about the new dashboard and equally excited about the growth of renewable energy in every state in America. Um, all right, so we finished up our big picture uh, part of the webinar, and now we're gonna dive into some of the individual state stories. And first, I'm really delighted to introduce my colleague, Laura Dehan, who is the State Director of Environment California Research and Policy Center, who will introduce Senator Laird. Go ahead, Laura. Thank you so much, Johanna. I'm excited to be here. And, um, you know, I, I'm zooming in from the Bay Area, from Richmond, California. And, um, you know, here in California, we are really proud that our state continues to light the way toward this 100% renewable energy future that we're talking about today. Um, I was a student um, at UC Davis back in the early 2000s when California was hit with an energy crisis and we couldn't actually keep the lights on. We later found out because uh, the energy company Enron was manipulating the market. Um, but we used that moment to really push for our state's first renewable energy law that required that we get at least 20% of our electricity from renewables at the time by, we said by 2017. Um, and following the passage of that law, um, we saw investments and um, kind of support for renewable energy really grow in our state. We were then able to up those requirements and increase the standards over the next several years till in 2018, we got the first 100% clean energy law put in place, SB 100. Um, and, uh, you know, that was really exciting. That was a great moment. Um, we're now seeing uh, clean energy expand in leaps and bounds in our state. Um, in fact, earlier this year, there was a couple of days when we saw for a few minutes, not for the whole day, but for several minutes, that uh, California was generating more electricity from renewables um, than we even needed to meet all of our state's electricity needs which is pretty incredible because we're a really big state. <laughs> um, and so we've seen that when we put in, in place the policies and when we set ambitious goals, um, it really see, uh, it helps to lead the, uh, the kind of investments and um, you know, the, the renewables just grow and grow and grow. And so we just need to keep doing that. Um, California also put in place our Million Solar Roofs Initiative in 2006. Um, we ended up exceeding that goal ahead of schedule. We now have 1.5 million solar rooftop systems all across our state. Um, when uh, Governor Jerry Brown was in office, he set a goal of getting a million electric vehicles, and we just met that goal as well. Um, also ahead of schedule by a couple of years. Um, so we're seeing um, that goal setting really, really works. Um, and um, actually just about a month ago, California set a new goal for clean energy, and that was uh, to go big on offshore wind. We set a goal of getting 25 gigawatts of our power from offshore wind by 2045 and five gigawatts by 2030. Um, so that means by 2045, about a quarter of our power will come from offshore wind um, right off our coast, uh, which is pretty incredible. 
Um, and so I'm really, really proud to introduce one of our state's top leaders who has really helped to make this vision a reality. Um, and that is Senator John Laird. Um, Senator Laird was elected to the State Assembly back in 2002 and has been there every step of the way to push our, our state's ambitious environmental and clean energy bills forward. He served as the Secretary <coughs> of the California Natural Resources <coughs> Agency under the Brown administration, and he was recently re-elected to the State Senate in 2020, where he has led the charge um, in accelerating California toward that 100% clean energy future, um, and in particular with the being the lead author of SB 1020 that put in place uh, benchmarks to make sure we get to at least 90% clean energy by 2035. So I'm very proud to introduce Senator John Laird. Well, thank you, Laura. That, that was really sweet. And uh, you did part of my job and I'm very grateful for uh, uh, your description. And I think because we have people from all over the country listening, it's really important to describe uh, some of our progress, part of which uh, Laura just mentioned, because for those of us in the political realm as well, it allows us to push back on some of the arguments. And I was one of the first co-authors when I was in the assembly of two th in 2006 of Assembly Bill 32. And when the federal government walked away from the Kyoto Protocols, we had a bill that placed the Kyoto Protocols on California and that we would return to our emissions, emissions of 1990 by 2020. And the arguments, it was, it was officially termed a job killer. It was gonna hurt the economy. Uh, it was a goal and so it was vague. We were never gonna get there. And, and what in reality happened when we adopted that law is that we got to that goal two years earlier California moved to the fifth largest economy in the world. So there's no argument that it hurt the economy in doing it. And it really spurred all the actions underneath it that we needed to take. And the same thing happened in the first year of the Brown administration when I was in the cabinet, where the governor signed a bill saying by 2020, we were gonna go to 33% renewables in our electricity portfolio. And we beat that goal. And so the important thing is, is how we uh, move to the next ones, how we get to 2045 where we're 100 percent. And the bill that that uh, Lauren described uh, that I was the lead author of basically said, we're going to have interim goals. We're going to really make sure that we can measure, we can kickstart, we can uh, uh, not just sort of have this one goal that's out there. We really know that we have targets along the way and we have to move to meet them. And we also had in the same bill uh, a goal of, uh, of 100% um, carbon uh, neutral in our state operations by 2035. And so we really set that. And this year we had a broad package. And I think it's a real message to people that see last year, we did not have a good year on policy in California legislatively. We had a good year on the budget, but not on policy. And the Senate president said, well, I'm not going to allow that to happen again. So she appointed a 12 senator working group on climate. I, I was named the chair and we came up with an 11 bill package that landed on the governor's desk. And it was the, the 1020 was the biggest bill, but underneath it was well capping um, our transportation sector, really trying to have equity in EV charging deserts and equity in multifamily houses for, for uh, uh, electric vehicles. And really, we, we had a high road labor uh, uh, agreement that we weren't successful with, and we're going to have to come back. And we want to lower utility rates among low-income people. We weren't successful, and we'll want to come back. But equity was at the heart of what we did. And I even authored this part of the package, and it, it was great to to hear the presentation uh, uh, that we uh, uh, just had by Tony, because I authored a bill where we are setting up our own state dashboard. So uh, after January 1st, exactly what Tony described nationally, we will have for the state of California, I mean, governor has signed it and legislatively we will move. And I think there's, there's an interesting message um, 
on two things to everybody that's listening. And, and one is, is on the goals, they work. And we really have to work underneath it to make sure we do it. We also had $1.1 billion for, uh, to kickstart uh, renewables. We had a large amount, billions and billions related to electric vehicles in our one-time monies. And, and we did that this year to make sure uh, we, we really come in under these goals. But the other thing is, is my own district, and I represent one of the most beautiful districts in, the, in California. It starts in the, in the Santa Cruz coast and goes across the Monterey Bay and down the Big Sur coastline and San Luis Obispo. And if you look at my own district, we had two huge fossil fuel plants for years. One is the largest battery storage plant now in California. And the second one will exceed it when the battery storage is actually built. And the transmission was there. It was a, uh, it was a transition from fossil fuel to battery storage. And Diablo Canyon, which we will eventually close, that is in my district, and that's a whole other subject. But the transmission there, if it extends to 2029 or 2030, will be available when the first major offshore wind comes in. So we transition out from nuclear power, use the same transmission and transition in from offshore wind. So we really now have to make sure that we do it. That is our challenge. We have the goals. We have met every goal that we've set for ourselves. We have funded so many different things in the transition. We are expediting what it takes for offshore wind. We are expediting what it takes for electrical, uh, electric vehicles. We're doing much more well capping. Uh, we're trying to make sure there's labor equity in, in what we're doing. And we're trying to make sure that everyone has a fair shot at participating in the transition in California, whether it's electric vehicles or rooftop solar or everything else. So uh, I'm really proud that this year with the package that was assigned, we are reasserting our leadership on climate. And now I think we have a lot to teach, but we have a lot to learn. And I really look forward to working with people across the country and doing, learning what worked for them as we continue our march to meet these goals and really make a fundamental difference. And, and when I was in the cabinet, we didn't take away walking from the, the, away from the Paris Accords lightly. We went around and did an international alliance on ocean acidification and worked on the under two a coalition with people that were subnationals everywhere. And the real message is, is do what you can in whatever way you can. Uh, uh, to make a fundamental difference. So uh, I really appreciate the chance to be here with you today and, and look forward to all our work as we continue to make great progress on this. Senator Laird, thank you so much and thanks for your leadership. Um, it's really exciting to have California have been the second state in the country to commit to 100% clean electricity, now be walking the walk um, to realize that vision. So thank you for being here today. We are going to virtually travel 3,000 miles across the country from California to the great state of Rhode Island. Um, I unfortunately just heard that Governor McKee is unable to join us, but one of his chiefs of staff, Pastor Chris Abolim, is going to be joining us. And to give you a sense of why we're excited to have Rhode Island participate in today's webinar, um, earlier this summer, Governor McKee signed into law the nation's fastest plan to commit to 100% renewable electricity by 2033. Um, and without further ado, looking forward to hearing from Pastor Chris Abilene. Go ahead. Thank you so much. And thank you everybody uh, for joining and uh, good afternoon or good morning or good evening, whatever you are uh, across this nation and across the world if you're joining today. Um, I'm joining on behalf of our governor Governor Dan McKee, uh, he wasn't able to join today for a uh, technical reason, actually. But he wanted me to uh, be here on his behalf. And like we just heard, Rhode Island is taking very aggressive and bold steps towards our renewable future. And, and for us here at Rhode Island, we believe that moving towards uh, the re uh, renewable future is it's a natural progression. And there are auto manufacturers right now that have uh, 
decided that they're not going to be producing uh, fossil fuel vehicles uh, in the very near future. So for us, we have to uh, face the future today and not postponing the future. So what has happened in Rhode Island, uh, especially this year, has been our best legislative year for clean energy. And one of the things that the governor did here in Rhode Island coming into office last year, March of last year, is sign the Act on Climate. The Act on Climate gives us a roadmap into our renewable future. And on top of that, this year, he signed the 100% uh, renewable standard. Uh, and that is a big deal for Rhode Island because it puts us on the path aggressively and boldly to uh, 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 make our state a full of renewable energy between now and uh, 2033. And I'm not sure that there is any state in the nation that has uh, such an aggressive goal. But we do believe that we can accomplish that goal. We have benchmarks along the way. Uh, within our state government is the EC4, the Climate Coordinating Council. And that council is saddled with the, with the responsibility of helping our state government to implement these goals. And they've been uh, meeting aggressively as well to ensure that each be benchmark along the way uh, is met and reported to the governor's office and also to the General Assembly. And not only that, um, we set the 100% renewable energy standard for 2033. Uh, the governor, our governor, McKee, put forward a bill this year and signed into law up to 1,000 1, megawatt uh, procurement of en renewable energy for Rhode Island. And that would be enough to power 500,000, up to 500,000 homes here in Rhode Island. And for us, again, Rhode Island, that's a big deal. We are a very small state. We are the ocean state. And so 1,000 megawatts of renewable energy, it's a big deal for Rhode Island size. And uh, the governor continues to pursue other strategy. Uh, for us, it's not just the production of renewable energy or distribution of renewable energy. Uh, it's also storage of renewable energy. So recently here in Rhode Island, we commissioned uh, a utility scale battery storage plant. And just after we commissioned that storage plant, we had uh, a very big outage in, in that area of our state. And so the battery storage plant became very, very useful to maintaining our stability in, in electricity. And so our technology here cuts across the span, whether it be uh, offshore wind uh, production and interconnecting that into our grid and modernizing our grid or store, storing energy that we produce from our renewable and making that available when we need it. And so across all of this continuum, Rhode Island is really taking bold step and, and moving fast into renewable future. And what that brings to Rhode Island beyond, beside or beyond having uh, stable energy is good paying jobs. Because here in Rhode Island, as Ocean State, we have 400 uh, mile of uh, coastline and we can harness our coastline for renewable production. And then that comes with good paying jobs. And so our governor is very vested in improving and, and scaling up our economy by investing boldly in renewable energy space. So we're very blessed uh, to have what we have here in Rhode Island and also a governor that truly believes in, in re renewable future. And not only that, our legislators are very much supportive of this idea and continue to work with uh, the executive branch to see that we continue to be leaders in Rhode Island for renewable energy. And before I end, one thing that we also uh, our governor has uh, gotten involved with and very supportive with is a regional approach to uh, renewable energy, offshore wind in this, in this case. And so we are part of a consortium of uh, states along the uh, Eastern coast to form this partnership where we share best practices together. Uh, potentially we share uh, technology, potentially we share skills and help also to deal with the issue of uh, supply chain. Because as we move into producing 
uh, uh, material and and all the things that we need to uh, build up our renewable energy equipment, we're going to need uh, collaboration and cooperation between states. And so that we're not competing against each other. Massachusetts is not competing against Rhode Island. Uh, Connecticut is not competing against Massachusetts. And so that all of these states are, uh, along the Eastern coast can partner together in this effort of really uh, uh, building up uh, renewable energy within our uh, various states and sharing uh, uh, skills, like I said, and, and other uh, resources that help us to be uh, leaders in this space and not depending on, on foreign uh, uh, governments or foreign countries to produce uh, materials that is needed for uh, building up our wind farm. So these are some of the things that's happening in Rhode Island. And um, we, we are very uh, happy to share our uh, experience with other states. And we're also willing to learn from other states. And the senator that, that just spoke from California, it looked like uh, similar efforts are going on in California as well. Uh, Rhode Island here, we are happy to partner with states like California to learn from what you're doing over there and share our experience as well from here in Rhode Island. So thank you uh, for inviting Rhode Island to participate in this. And uh, we're um, uh, looking forward to hearing other people's thoughts and perhaps answer some questions today. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you so much. And if you can stay for the discussion, we'd welcome that. It's so great to hear about Rhode Island's commitment and what led to it and the collaborative approach you're taking um, on your road to 100% renewable energy. So congratulations and thank you again. Thank you. Um, our next speaker is from Oregon. I'm excited to introduce Adam Schultz, who is the lead for electricity and markets policy group at the Oregon Department of Energy. In that role, Adam leads the department's focus on electricity policy, really getting into the weeds on electricity planning, energy markets, and making sure there's enough power to keep the lights on. So Adam, go ahead. Great, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thanks for the introduction. Uh, Adam Schultz, the lead electricity group here at the Oregon Department of Energy. So uh, great to hear the previous speakers. I want to build a little bit off of what we heard from Professor Jacobson in terms of sort of the land use impact of the scale of renewables needed. And then also, I think uh, some of the comments from Senator Laird were, were really resonated with me around, we need to now make sure we do it, right? Oregon has joined the, the litany of states with 100% clean targets and really where we are now in terms of next steps is implementation and thinking about how can we engage stakeholders in an intentional way to guide the inequitable clean energy transition that balances uh, various trade-offs. So with that, I'll, I'll run through a few slides here with a few visuals. And uh, first I wanna uh, help uh, understand the scale of the transition from the state of Oregon's perspective. And along the way, I'll throw in some glamour shots uh, from our beautiful state. I encourage you all to, to come visit us. Uh, so first I'll start with uh, reduction in carbon emissions. So it's just showing how far we have to go to get to our 2050 goals. And this is really the reason that we're that we're doing this, right? Why are we trying to get to 100% clean energy? To decarbonize our economy. So this is just a snapshot here. Probably not surprising to folks who are, who are interested in following these issues, but uh, this, is, this is why we're doing what we're doing and, and where we're headed. And so where's the power system today in Oregon and the Northwest? What I'm showing here is Months of the year, January uh, January through December from 2020, showing the resource mix month by month. Uh, the blue bar that jumps out there is hydropower. We're fortunate here in the Northwest to have a really large carbon-free hydropower system as the foundation of our, of our electricity grid. So you can see the contribution that makes throughout the year. A few other notes here though, solar, that small yellow line is just beginning to show up here in the Northwest. So we have a ways to go with solar. The gray bars here are coal. Uh, Oregon is the first state, maybe the only state at this point, to have legislated the elimination of coal from our electricity resource mix uh, by 2030. So these gray bars will have to be replaced uh, by the end of this decade. And I also wanna highlight here uh, the contribution that coal and natural gas currently makes in the fall and winter months, particularly here in the Northwest, a bit different from California, more similar to Rhode Island, colder winters, uh, not, as, not quite as sunny in the winter and fall months, uh, we're gonna have to really think about a more diverse base of renewables that can help us decarbonize the power system in those months. 
So with that sort of as a foundation, a little level setting of where we are in the Northwest, uh, let's take a look at where we're going to get to our 100% clean energy future here in Oregon and the region. So first, uh, we've looked at dozens of technical studies. We've done a lot of work at our department to help communicate the scale of the transition uh, to our stakeholders, our legislators, and the governor's office. And really what they're all showing is there's a significant growth in demand for electricity is coming our way. That's really, if you think about uh, the transportation sector and all the use of liquid fossil fuels today, that's all going to be electrified. That's going to be a primary, uh, a primary driver of this growth in addition to electrifying home heating and some other uses. Uh, but that's going to require a significant build out of new renewable energy. So the, the studies that we've seen, and this is again just one consultant study, but uh, 80,000 megawatts of new wind and solar being needed in the next two and a half decades here in the Pacific Northwest. Uh, but you know, one thing I'd say that's important is that uh, across all the studies we look at, echoing what Professor Jacobson said, uh, the analysis shows clearly we can do this, right? And I think that's an important message as I go through some of the implementation steps and challenges that we're thinking about here in Oregon. Clearly, uh, you know, the technical capabilities are there, but I don't want to uh, overlook some of the implementation challenges. So, you know, again, voting off what Professor Jacobson said, if you look at sort of a statewide view or a national view, percentage of land you need for renewables might look relatively small on a percentage basis. But at a state energy office, uh, at the state level where we are, individual projects don't look that small. And so we, we're, we really are focused now in terms of next steps of helping to communicate the scale of this transition to our stakeholders so they can be intentional about balancing the trade-offs of various renewable development options and really uh, have that uh, intentional equitable strategy to get to where we need to get in 2050 to mitigate the impact of GHG emissions uh, on our society. So with that, I just wanted to give a few examples here. Certainly there are a lot of trade-offs. Uh, we have a lot of fish and wildlife impacts to consider. There are impacts on uh, various uh, communities that can vary depending on different pathways. But here, just for some visuals, uh, think about the, the landscape level land use impacts of some of our different choices. So as an example, um, just for the national audience, I know we have folks from all over trying to show uh, some scale of what it looks like uh, to develop solar projects. About 842 acres, Central Park there in New York City, you could fit about 150 megawatts of solar in Central Park. So going back to what the analysis shows we need in the Northwest, 80,000 megawatts, we need about 500 Central Parks worth of solar power. Here's an Oregon example, Crater Lake, for those who have visited. Uh, it's about 20 square miles of surface area, it's much larger than Central Park, but we need about, um, about 40 Crater Lakes uh, to get to 80,000 megawatts of solar in the Northwest. And of course, rooftop solar. I know there's a lot of interest, certainly in rooftop. It, it will have a role to play in the energy transition without a doubt. Uh, but the scale of what's needed to achieve our 100% clean energy future, uh, rooftop uh, likely won't be enough. So the average rooftop system in Oregon today is about eight kilowatts. So we would need 10 million rooftops uh, of solar to meet our goals. Uh, of course, we only have about 5 million residential units in the entire region. So uh, it, it certainly won't be enough, even if we covered every single rooftop. And then wind power. Uh, for those who have driven by any utility scale wind turbines, I think you'll appreciate the, I, I think they're quite beautiful, but they're, they're not small facilities and they're only getting larger, particularly as we move offshore. So just to put this in context, uh, well, we need about 4,000 Eiffel Towers uh, uh, of large wind turbines, larger, frankly, than we have currently deployed. But the expectation is I will probably be seeing 15 to 20 megawatt turbines by the time we're developing offshore in Oregon and the Northwest here in the decade ahead. So just a few key takeaways. I think the important message that we see and we see a value in communicating to our stakeholders is the modeling agrees we can certainly do this. Technically, uh, this is achievable, uh, but the scale is tremendous. I, I don't wanna downplay this, the scale because I think we really have um, lessons to learn from energy development in the 20th century to make sure that we're intentional and engaging uh, an inclusive conversation to chart our equitable path to 2050 here in the state of Oregon and the Northwest. And I think it's important that we keep a clear eyed view of the trade-offs involved with these different options. Of course, uh, the paramount trade-off is, is around mitigating the impact of climate change and GHG emissions, but it's not to say that our alternatives have no trade-offs either. So I think it's important that we're honest about that as we have an intentional informed conversation about where we're going. And then really our next step, where we are as a state here in 2022, having passed 100% clean energy standard last year, 
we're really starting to think about how can we really bring together stakeholders to identify what an optimal path for our state looks like uh, to get to that 2050 goal we all have of 100% clean energy economy wide. So that's where we are today in the state of Oregon, uh, not quite as far as California, but certainly trying to learn the lessons and um, look forward to the discussion the rest of the afternoon. Thanks so much. Great, thank you so much, Adam. It is um, heartening to see you and everyone else in Oregon grappling with what it will take to move that state to 100% carbon-free electricity. So thank you for your work. Um, it is around 2.56. I hope people can stay for a little bit longer. I understand if people need to hop off at three o'clock, um, but I'm excited to introduce our next speaker, Ben Hellerstein. So Ben has been at the hub of clean energy advocacy work in Massachusetts for the better part of the past decade. He conceived of and has been running a state level 100% renewable energy campaign um, in Massachusetts since 2016, um, was a leader in the effort to get Massachusetts to commit to 20% renewable energy sources by 2025, and was one of the lead advocates in the recently passed climate bill. Um, so Ben, without further ado, I'll hand it off to you. Great. Uh, well, thank you so much, Johanna. Um, again, my name is Ben Hellerstein, and I'm the state director for Environment Massachusetts. Uh, it's really great to uh, be part of, part of this webinar today and, and to hear from all of our speakers. Um, I think this really gives a picture of the this growing movement for 100% clean energy across the country and everything that all of us are, are accomplishing together. Um, so I'm just going to speak briefly about uh, some of our goals in Massachusetts and then uh, what we have accomplished um, just in the last few months and then uh, what we see as the path ahead uh, going into next year. So um, in Massachusetts, the, the need for us to get off of fossil fuels is pretty obvious. Uh, you know, like Rhode Island, uh, we are a coastal state. Uh, we're, we're the Bay State here. Um, in, in Boston Harbor, uh, you know, we've gotten to the point where on, on sunny days when the tide is particularly high, uh, parts of the coastline will flood, you know, even when there's no, when there's no storm. Um, we know that uh, these impacts are, are poised to become a lot worse unless we move quickly to get off of fossil fuels. Um, experts predict that sea levels around Boston could rise by an additional 10 feet by the end of the century. Uh, so there, there is a tremendous amount of urgency that I think all of us feel uh, in terms of um, getting our state off of fossil fuels and, and towards renewable energy. Uh, Massachusetts has committed to a goal of net zero carbon emissions by 2050. Uh, but at Environment Massachusetts, we believe that we need to go even further. Uh, we think we should be aiming not just for net zero emissions, but actually for zero emissions, um, at least for the, the three sectors that account for the vast majority of our greenhouse gas pollution in our state. Uh, and, and those three sectors are electricity, uh, buildings, and transportation. So uh, we're aiming to get to zero emissions to 100% clean energy for each of those sectors and, and to achieve that uh, sooner than 2050. Um, about four or five years ago, we worked with state representatives Marjorie Decker and Sean Garbley to introduce one of the first state bills uh, calling for an economy-wide transition to 100% clean energy. And um, since then, working with many coalition partners, we have made significant progress towards achieving our vision of, of uh, a future powered by clean energy. Uh, most recently in August, uh, our state legislature passed a climate bill that the governor signed into law uh, that takes a number of really important steps forward uh, to achieve this clean energy vision across all of our major sectors. Um, just to highlight a couple of the, the key components of this bill. Uh, first of all, is that it, it removes some uh, arbitrary obstacles that were standing in the way of both solar and offshore wind projects, um, enabling Massachusetts to get more of our electricity from renewables in the coming years. Um, this law will require that 100% of the cars that are sold in Massachusetts will be electric vehicles by the year 2035. Um, it also requires uh, the MBTA, the, the public transit agency in the Boston area, uh, to transition to 100% electric buses. Um, it establishes a new requirement for the owners of large buildings, like offices and apartments, to report their energy use each year, which is a really important first step towards uh, making those buildings more energy efficient over time. Um, and it is going to allow up to 10 cities and towns across the state to adopt policies on the local level, uh, requiring that all new buildings that are built in those communities have to be all electric and, and fossil fuel free. 
So, um, you know, across the board in, in sort of every major sector of energy use, this bill takes a number of, of really important uh, steps forward towards a clean energy future. Uh, that being said, we're, we're not stopping there. <laughs> and uh, you can bet that we're going to keep pushing forward. Um, in fact, we have just launched a new campaign uh, calling on our, our state's leaders uh, to commit to bring the equivalent of a million solar roofs to Massachusetts uh, by the year 2030. Um, and we're really excited to be getting that underway, um, especially this fall. We have a, a gubernatorial election. We're going to be having a, a new governor coming into office in January, um, as well as many other top state leaders. And so this is a really important time for us to be talking about these big clean energy goals and, and showing a lot of support behind that. So um, I'll wrap up there and I'll just say again, it's been really great to be part of this webinar today. I think, um, you know, this just goes to show uh, this growing national movement for 100% renewable energy. And, um, you know, together we are transforming the way that America produces and consumes energy one state at a time, one state at a time, which I think is just really exciting. So um, with that, I will hand it back to Johanna. Thanks so much, Ben. I am eager to move to the Q&A, but before I do that, I just want to offer a couple of resources to folks who might be saying, wow, well, this is all great policy level stuff, but what can I do in my own life? Um, so the first is I want to invite everyone here to attend another webinar next Wednesday, the 28th at 3 o'clock p.m. Eastern Time entitled How to Electrify Your Home. And Environment America Research and Policy Center is co-hosting this event um, in partnership with U.S. Perg Education Fund and our allies at Rewiring America. And it's really um, to give you firsthand information about how do you install, you know, how to think about installing a heat pump or a heat pump out water heater or, um, you know, taking steps to make your home more energy efficient. So I encourage everyone to go there. And I believe Celeste just put a link to how to RSVP for that webinar in the chat if you're curious about taking those steps. Secondly. Um, I know a lot of people on already have solar panels, but if you are curious about how to go solar, Environment Oregon Research and Policy Center had a discussion last month about how to go solar, and um, there's a recording of that webinar, and so we'll put a link to that in the chat as well. And if you say, you know what, I've been thinking about going solar for ages, but I just haven't pulled the trigger, um, and Coming out of today's webinar, you're inspired to take that action. Um, I wanted to let you know that Environment America has partnered up with an organization called Energy Sage, which offers, um, it's a free interface that offers unbiased uh, information and allows you to put in your information to get competitive bids for solar projects. Um, and they do both rooftop solar, ground mount solar, as well as community solar projects. Um, and so we'll put that link in as well. Um, and last but not least, well, actually I have two more links. One is, um, and I think one of the questions in the chat got at this, but the cleanest source of energy is the energy we never use in the first place. And we can all take steps to reduce energy waste in our, our homes. Um, so I'll have Celeste just drop in here, our citizen's guide to reducing energy waste, which offers some good common sense tips for how you can um, take control of energy use in your own home. And then last but not least, individual actions definitely help, but ultimately we need larger political change to really accomplish a vision of a future powered by 100% clean renewable energy. And so um, for anybody who's joining today from a state that has not yet committed to 100% renewable energy, we'll put a link in here where you can email your state legislators encouraging your state to get on the path to 100% renewable energy, make the commitments, and then put in place the building blocks to get there. Um, all right, with that, I just want to close out really quickly that, you know, our goal for today was to show everyone the immense progress that we're seeing. And if you remember that map of 10 states that are deep gold and 11 states where we're actively campaigning, Together, individuals, businesses, and policy leaders can reach a vision where every single state in America will be a deep gold color. Um, and it'll mean a healthier and safer future that we leave for our kids and grandkids. So thank you again for joining. And with that, I'm gonna move on to the Q&A section. So my first question I think is directed to Dr. Jacobson. So um, here's the question. 
it sounds like from what you said, green hydrogen isn't an ideal energy storage for electricity genera generation. So what would you suggest we do with renewable generation over 100% that would otherwise be unusable? Well, batteries are the answer in most cases. So you can have long-term long duration storage with four hour batteries simply by concatenating them together. So batteries are very nimble in that you can use them either for short-term storage at very high discharge rate uh, when you run them in parallel or when you run them in series, one after the other, you can run, you know, if you have 100 four-hour batteries, that's 400 hours of storage at the peak discharge rate of one battery or anything in between. So they're very re resilient in between. I mean, hydrogen for well, electricity storage, I mean, it's clean. It, it just takes two to three times the number of wind turbines or solar panels as using batteries. So it's, it's just a question of efficiency. Um, and there are so many different types of batteries now that uh, I don't envision, you know, hydrogen will have a reason to be used for stationary storage, but yeah, batteries. And there are also other types of storage, like uh, not only compressed air, but gravitational storage. I mean, pumped hydro is the largest type of storage right now, aside from hydroelectric dams. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that'll probably grow a little bit as well, pumped hydro. I mean, there's enough pumped hydro to power, like to provide storage for everything worldwide. There are just so many pumped hydro sites. However, and it's also cheaper than, the pumped hydro is cheaper than batteries. However, it's just diff, more difficult to site and get approved. And it'll it just takes longer to implement. So that's why batteries will probably be the best in the long run. Great, that's really helpful, thank you. Um, we have another question about the role that government can play. So specifically, you know, military buildings and other government buildings are huge energy consumers. What role can they play? Um, and I was thinking, Laura, maybe you could talk a little bit about the provisions in California to walk the walk, but Tony or Mark, if you have thoughts on this as well, I'd welcome your thoughts. Um, I can share that one of the key elements of SB 1020, the bill that we were so excited just got signed into law on Friday, um, is that not only does it require, does it set benchmarks on the way to 100%, so we now will have to get 90% of our electricity from clean sources by 2035, but it also requires that 100% of state agency, so state government energy, uh, come from clean energy sources by 2035. So that's a more ambitious timeline, obviously, than the whole rest of the state's going to have to meet. And we think that's a great example of our state leaders really walking the walk, as you said, Johanna, not just talking the talk, not just setting the goals for everybody else. Um, and then I'd also mention that um, I know that the Department of Defense has been really instrumental in laying the groundwork for us to be able to go big on offshore wind here in California as well. And so that's another very concrete way that, um, that the Department of Defense has played a role already and um, the, will play a role, I think, moving forward is, um, you know, that they have um, all sorts of activities that they already do off the coastline. And so we're gonna need their uh, partnership in um, leading this massive transition of our economy toward a clean energy economy um, so that we can we can really do that. Yeah, the only thing I'd add is that, um, you know, we've talked a lot in this webinar about state level um, commitments to renewable energy, but this is also a movement that has been taking place at the local level as well. So there are hundreds of communities around the country uh, that have made, made similar commitments. And the local government role is really critical, especially when you are talking about things like permitting. Um, so we've been working uh, with the uh, National Renewable Energy Laboratory, I know Environment America has, um, to encourage the adoption of Solar App, which is a automated uh, solar permitting uh, software, um, and also to facilitate the growth of electric vehicles. And we had done a um, uh, resource guide, uh, which I can post in the chat uh, last year on steps that local governments can take to facilitate the transition to electric vehicles. Um, so some of that is what government can do as government with its procurement policies, uh, to purchase clean energy and purchase clean energy technologies. Uh, but then part of it is also what local governments can do um, within the very unique role that they have to play in helping individuals to adopt individuals and, and companies to adopt clean energy. Excellent. Thanks, Tony. 
Um, here's a good question. How do you get rental apartments to go solar? Can renters convince landlords? What are other mechanisms folks can use to get non-owner occupied buildings to go solar? Any of our panelists want to take this one? I can offer an, I can offer some answer to that. Yeah. You know, I'd say uh, there's two things I would think of in that, and which is, you know, particularly in a state like Oregon, where we have our investor and utilities already required to provide 100% clean energy. Uh, to some extent, those those uh, renters, as everyone who are customers of those utilities, will be going 100% clean just by being customers of the utility. So that's one benefit of these aggressive state policies um, is that we, we start to fill those gaps, even if they can't easily get solar panels on their rooftop. Um, so that's one advantage. There's also opportunities for community solar and sort of uh, some virtual policies that allow renters to take advantage of, of um, smaller distributed renewable projects. We have those here in Oregon and I know some other states uh, have similar programs. Yeah, I'll just add, I think, um, I mean, this is this is a big challenge, you know, certainly for rental housing um, and, and also for many commercial buildings as well. And, and the issue is that, you know, the the person or the entity that owns the building, right, is not the same as the person or the entity that is occupying it and using the energy. And so the, the person who owns the building doesn't necessarily have the incentive to put up rooftop solar panels, you know, depending on how, how the policy framework is set up. Um, one idea that some uh, municipalities are in Massachusetts are looking at to try to address this issue is to basically set up like a an entity, you know, whether it's an arm of the municipal government or a nonprofit that could essentially um, own, like own the solar panels and be the off taker for the energy and um, lease the rooftop space, you know, whether it's from an apartment building or commercial uh, property, and then sort of be a community solar provider, you know, where they could then um, allocate those credits, you know, either to low income residents in the community or to all community members, you know, across the board to increase their, their percentage of renewable power. So, um, so that's a really interesting idea we're keeping an eye on and hopefully, you know, that'll be a model that will be successful and, and could, um, you know, replicate to, to get more, uh, more solar in these buildings that have, you know, up to this point been being kind of tricky to figure out. Great. We're going to do two more questions and then we're going to wrap up. So the next question is, how do we feel about fusion energy and why do we feel that way? So I recognize not everybody here, you know, may, might feel the same way, but um, yeah, it'd be, maybe this is uh, Tony and Mark could feel this one for starters. I'm happy to let Mark take a crack at this one first. <laughs> um, well, we think that we only want to focus on technologies that are available today and and or can be implemented quickly or we know how to do them at low cost and fusion is not even existing i mean it doesn't exist it's not it's a technology that some groups say they're have incremental improvements here and there and it might be available in five ten years but these are just prototypes too we need to solve 80 percent of the problem in in eight years and this means that deploying 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 what we have today we have so much wind and solar and even some geothermal and and uh, even tidal waiver further along than fusion and battery storage and heat pumps and electric vehicles. We have just so much to do with existing technologies that I don't like the distractions we've had on not only with fusion, but just even small modular reactors. They're not even gonna be around till for eight to 10 years if they are ever. And, they, and we don't even know what their impacts will be. And carbon capture is not even, it's been studied for 30 years and we still don't have uh, anything useful with that. And you know, we need to act now and implement as quickly as possible with what we have. And we know what works at low cost. And this is clean, renewable energy and storage. And that's what we should focus on. Thanks, Mark. All right, final question. Is there one particular criticism of transitioning to renewables that's been hardest to counter in the public arena? And what is it? I Mark will, or Tony, either one. Well, I, I'll let, I, I think Laura and Ben probably have, uh, you know, as much experience in talking with people um, about these issues, certainly more than I do. But the one thing that I would just say is that I think that it takes, it takes a while, I think, for people to recognize the degree to which things have changed. And, you know, if, you know, I'm, I, I have been around long enough to remember when, 
um, you know, solar and wind power were, you know, a rounding error in our energy supply and, you know, considered, you know, almost certainly likely to be, you know, too expensive, um, you know, it, folks would talk about, well, maybe the grid could handle 10 or 20 percent. Um, and today, I think what we're finding is that not only have the prices of solar and wind power and battery storage declined to such a degree that now they are clearly the cheapest forms of new power generation and likely to carry the vast majority of the ball in decarbonization. But we also know from experience that we can integrate more and more renewable energy into our grid. It doesn't happen without thought. It doesn't happen without planning, but it can happen and it is possible. And I think for, you know, for a lot of folks who, you know, this is new information to people, um, you know, the fact that solar and wind is as cheap as it is, it's as versatile it is, as it is, and we can make it, um, you know, work. So to me, I think a lot of the concerns and objections are just letting folks know about what's happening, letting folks know about the potential, um, highlighting the challenges because they are real challenges, but also focusing people on the fact that we now have, as Dr. Jacobson said, we now have the tools to do this. We have the, the capacity to do it. We've moved from can we to how will we do it? And I, I think that's that's the place where we're in this interesting transitional period now. And I think it's going to take people a little while to catch up, but hopefully. It will. No, I'll just add that, yeah, the main thing I hear about is grid stability, whether we can keep the grid stable. And yes, we can. I mean, there are 10 countries in the world that have 100% renewable electricity. For, and they've had it for many years. Most of them are largely hydro, but some are becoming more wind and geothermal. Um, the other thing is now a big red herring that's popping up is mining. You know, people are saying, "Oh, it's going to take so much material." Not not admitting that you know the actual amount of mining will go down by a factor of ten because we continuously mine fossil fuels every day, and that will be eliminated. We have fifty thousand new oil and gas wells drilled in North America every year. We have one point. 3 million active ones and 3.2 million abandoned ones and 29 million abandoned wells worldwide. And we eliminate all that mining. And so the actual amount of mining goes down by order of magnitude. And yet people focus on, oh, well, we, it's going to cause all sorts of devastation, all this mining. It just, it's, a, it's, it's really a distraction, I think, in that case. Thank you, everyone, so much. It's been a pleasure. Um, we, like I said in the chat, I think. Um, people are eager for these resources. So as soon as we get a recording of this webinar, I will send everyone who RSVP'd for today's webinar a link with the recording, a write-up of the key points, the resources, and we'll try to get answers to some of the questions that we didn't get to as well. I want to thank all of our panelists. We know you're busy doing important work to change the world, and we're so grateful for your time. Um, and thank you all again for joining us today. Take care. Be well.